haven't been doing that. Connect <laughs> your minds. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer. and we, I should have the new church version up there for you, but yeah, if not, we'll just make our way through. Our Father, Father who art right in the heavens, heavens hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom be come, be thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So have a seat. What a wonderful idea. Have you ever done anything like that with cards? No? I'll give it a go. I do cards for, for abiding in the vine. Maybe I can make some up with the Lord's Prayer. That's a great idea. I'm going to just, I'm not going to worry about getting the, the offering, but let's just, Lord, we lift that offering up to you, even as every breath and every heartbeat is a gift from you. We give it to you and we thank you for all that we have. And we know it's your delight to pour out abundantly into our life till our cups are overflowing. Amen. Amen. So we're going to do part two. This was a, a one-part study. I always, if it's two pages long, it's usually a one-part study, but so much came out and it's always good when that happens. I, I am happy for that to happen. So much came out that we never, we got to the bottom of the page and I thought, well, as long as Bill comes back next time, we'll, 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 we'll do part two on the other side. Well, because there was some really good stuff that he brought out. So let's just read the, the, the parable. And he, the Lord, spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this men, man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Every time the Lord speaks, hello, Paul, hello, Faith. Every time the Lord speaks, he is speaking multi-dimensionally always it must always remember the Lord is commenting on the outer world but he's always commenting on the inner world as well in fact I would say more often than not he would just go straight for the inner world someone would ask him a question he would almost ignore the question and go straight to some other issue but the person was feeling very very dealt with in the way the Lord answered so I really want us to before we go into part two I really want us to remember reading this we, our mind will tend to shift externally into one or the other. Oh, Lord, I've been a real Pharisee, haven't I? You know? Or, Lord, come in. Or, Lord, uh, I, 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 I relate to this guy who feels such a, such a terrible sinner, you know? Sorry, sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. We're good. Sure. Do we have you? You two share. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did you bring another one in? I've got my iPad. Oh, there you go. Married couples share. <laughs> They're allowed to touch. A holy air hug from the Lord. So you go. So there's. We need to remember that all of sacred text is inside us. All of it there. There's those states inside us where we're judging other people. We don't mean to do it, but we have an ego. And that ego needs to feel good. And so we might judge other people. We might look through the lens of that ego. 
You know, uh, Trevor handed me his glasses and said, look at, look at the world through these, the colour of these. And so the Lord has a way of really penetrating, penetrating that fog of our ego and helping us see what's really going on. But when we read something like this, we must remember that we're all the ingredients. So today you came up those stairs, and as you came up those stairs, two men came up those stairs, or two women came up those stairs. One, the natural you, through the natural mind, and two, the spiritual you. So inside us, when we're in the natural man, we're judging. We're passing judgment on others. But deeper underneath is that humbleness, that humility, that, that says, Lord, when we get into the presence of God, we say, wow, I'm not worthy of this. This is overwhelming me, the light and the heat of this presence of God. And that's humility. But if we stay in that humility, it's kind of like getting into a really, really hot bath. And then you adjust. And you think, oh, I could put even more hot water in there. Doesn't it? God is a fire. And at first we kind of react to the very presence of the divine. And there's that humility. Humility is the way forward. That's the thing I want us to take from this first study. Humility is the way we stay in, in relationship with God. Two men went up to the temple. One went away right with God, the other didn't. Those things in us that are judging are not right. But those things that forgive, that are merciful, that love, because we've been forgiven because we've had mercy shown to us, because we've had love shown to us. That's what goes away right. So just go to the very bottom there. Now, before I do that, does anybody want to comment on the first reading there of that parable? Anything jump out at you in that first reading? Yes, Christina. What, what do you see is the difference between judging and discernment? Beautiful question. Now, I'm happy for anybody else to answer that too, but my understanding, Christina, is if I actually feel love, and want to support you more from what I'm seeing, that's discernment. If I'm repelling from you, if I'm despising, if I'm in contempt, that's judgment. Or another way I look at it is that judgment is when you pass a sentence on someone, isn't it? When you believe you have a right to, to, to pass, just because you see something wrong in someone's life, doesn't mean you have a right to pass a sentence. If you see something wrong in their life, it's for two reasons. So you can help them, and because it's actually inside you. Because this external world is actually a mirror for what's going on in here and in yeah, here. I'll tell you what happened to help well last week. There was this uh, young, there was this woman aged 24 or 26 who was dragged up to see a Pharisee. The, ph the Pharisee was a psychiatrist, and she expected to see a... They come in all forms, don't they, Bill? Oh, yes. She Pharisees and psychiatrists. She expected to see a real Pharisee, one with the member of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. Right. But instead, she saw a sort of a half-baked Pharisee, half-boilermaker, me. Right? Now, this poor soul... And it, she came in, and I could tell as she as she walked in the door, she was one of these very beautiful, highly sensitive souls. And she had the story that she'd had an anxiety disorder since she was 14 or something. And, uh, you know, she'd been, uh, been told that she had all these this disorder. She was this public. And so uh, <clears throat> what had happened... Uh, is that when she'd finished grade 12, she didn't quite know what to study. Mm. So she, but what she, the only thing she was really interested in was art history. So anyway, she, she got a degree in art history and then she had to look for a job. Tough one. Well, there were no jobs. And um, so she had all these wounds about being, you know, being rejected, looked down on, and she thought she was the worst publican in the world, like she would, all these terrible, you know, she was suffering from anxiety, and, and so she, she was a, a, a second-class citizen who was a psychiatric patient. And um, anyway, I so I started to 
I took her back to when she got, she finished the university with her degree in art history. And uh, she knew about what Suzanne wrote down and all this. <laughs> she knew all that sort of stuff. But when I asked her about what it was like looking for a job mm. and being rejected and treating like a second class citizen, there's the tears. Yeah. Wow. Well, then she didn't have to s smote her breast or anything, but um, these Pharisees, uh, uh, a lot of them take the names of the name of psychiatrist, but there are there are other plenty of medical practices who uh, the having to say in your voice and so will catch you. So that's just a, a, a modern day version. It, Bill, isn't it fascinating too how much our sense of value and our worth is, it's not a bad thing, but it just is. It's connected to our work, isn't it? That, you know, we're doing something, we're giving back, we're contributing, we're working, and when someone yes, can't... But if you, when you take your, like, if your bus gets broken or something, you take it to a mechanic, he doesn't say, you are a defective citizen because your car is defective. No. Um, no. I think it's about time. Yeah. Now, now I have, I'm speaking as psychiatry because mm. I actually believe that psychiatry, as it is taught in practice, yep. is causing all these suicides. Mm. Mm. It's actually... It, um, these people, they rejoice in being atheists. Mm. Oh, oh, no, they don't believe in that. Anyone who does is a nitwit. They rejoice in that. Uh, and uh, so th th I seem to have a downer on psychiatrists, and I do. There's a, kind of, there's a kind of theft there too, because the human being is created in God's image, and when we're, we're not given a cultural way to connect with the divine, whatever that is, I mean, look at the Aboriginals and their way of connecting with the divine. If you take that from a people, there's a See, massive void. There's a massive void in their life. If every human being is unique, mm. how can you say that there is a, somebody's normal? What's normal? How can you say that there's a sort of an average and then you're normal? Mm. And if you happen to be a bit that way, well, you're abnormal. That's why you're abnormal. If every human being is unique, which I believe, and mm. every human being is a version of God, that every mm. human spirit is a version of God, mm. and uh, you never ever, you can, you can never see any other, the, 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 there's no other Christina in the cosmos. Cosmos, what a beautiful word. <laughs> that, this girl is totally unique. Yeah. And so, how can you say whether somebody's normal or abnormal or has a disorder? You can if you're passing judgment. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and this personality disorder, you get these, you get these poor people who, as children, were traumatised and they grow up uh, learning that the only way you can survive in this world is that if you've got a relationship with a grown-up, you've got to test them all the time. Mm -hmm. That's called um, uh, borderline personalities. Right. And it's it's time that it, it's time the whole population said, "Look, you psychiatrists, shut up! This it, what you're saying is wrong. Mm. It's disgusting. Mm. It, it's it's anti-God. It's anti-Christian. Mm. It doesn't." I, I have never, we, never yet seen a human being who was ever benefited by uh, by being told they had a personality disorder. No. So we got, and and so the Pharisees these days are professional Pharisees, and the psychiatrists are one good example. One good example. Yeah, there are mm. there are others. Mm. But. Um, Anyway, so uh, I'll just... Well, Bill, as, you, as Bill was talking, another thing came for me from this parable, and, and I'll throw it out to others too. I began, as Bill was talking, I began to realise the Pharisee's got his eyes on everyone else. He's got his eyes on the publican, yeah. isn't he? He's not for good. Yeah. Not, not to see good, but to criticise. The, the, what the publican has in his favour is he's just looking at improving himself. He's realising where his faults are and how where he lacks. 
and that's real growth. When you, can, when you have the courage to look inside yourself and see what you lack, that's real growth. That's fascinating. So is there something else? Sorry. Sorry. If the Pharisee had gone up and said, Lord, I am a pompous twit. Ah! <laughs> he might have gone home right with God. How can I change things? Be fine. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Did, oh, no, I've just got lots of did we get to the root of that question places. too? I could go. With Chris, that, but Christina knows a lot about this stuff. No, I'm not really. But it's like um, I was just thinking for Carl Jung and his um, what you were talking about the uniqueness, the uniqueness in the sense we're very similar, but then there's a path. A deep spiritual path that has its own uniqueness. Expression, and, yeah. And it's Beautiful. like to give thanks. Mm. And it's like that giving thanks. Mm. But then, um, and I think often that's a part of giving thanks is is very important because then that, that eliminates that judgment. It's like, yes. thank you for who I am. I'm not, there's people better off, people worse off, people clever and people, what you did, whatever, and the circumstances were important, but just thank you for that uniqueness of my spiritual path that has been given to me to deal with and evolve with that uniqueness. This, this is such a good point things. that Christine's making that when we can be thankful, uh, real thankfulness too, because if I'm truly thankful, I'm thankful, I mean, who couldn't be thankful for Ian or Bill or any of you? But notice how even the ego can hijack thankfulness. Just have a look here. Look back at the text. He says here, <coughs> third line down towards the end, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. <laughs> what is he thankful for? That I am not like these other people. <laughs> so even, even the ego can hijack thankfulness. But what Christine is highlighting there is, is the right kind of thankfulness, a real genuine gratitude. Because what are we if we're not vessels? Yeah. We're, not, we're not progenitors. We're not divine beings that create. We are a divine being that's been created and we're vessels for receiving. So we have a lot to be thankful for, isn't it? Is it we thankfulness have a... or self-righteousness? Yep, that's, that's a good point, Trevor. That's a good point. But even, even that, the, hi the ego can hijack. Thankfulness. I thank you, God, I'm not like him or her. Uh, yeah. Self-righteousness. Okay, quote here, it's a little bit like what Bill said about the bus, if the bus breaks down. Yeah. I asked a wise man, tell me sir, in which field could I make a great career? He said with a smile, be a good human being. There is a lot of opportunity in this area and very little competition. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when you said that, I thought, well, that's a good way of saying because if the bus breaks down, yeah. who are you without the bus? You're still a, a, an operator of the bus. I am not the bus. Yeah, yeah. So there is no spoon. You're not a bad <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, Any other thoughts before we I've move got, in? Yep. I've got a general question. So when you're talking about the scriptures having a literal meaning, mm. a spiritual meaning, and a celestial meaning, mm. as far as I understand, uh, Swedenborg only did the inner meaning of Genesis and half of Exodus. I don't know if that's true or not. So does that mean the rest of the Old Testament, we're not going to get the spiritual or celestial meaning unless we're celestial beings? because. Uh, as far as I know, that's the only bit where we, there's no, there's no ongoing, are, are, we, are we trying when we read scriptures mm -hmm. to do that ourselves? Because I just think mm -hmm. both, he only done so far, didn't he? I'm, I'm going to have a go at answering that, Ian, if you, if you want to have a go too, or Darren or anyone else. I would say, first and foremost, in my own work with, with sacred text and with Swedenborg, and working on parables and working on all sorts of passages through the Bible, the Swedenborg has almost quoted every verse of the Bible somewhere, yeah. to, maybe several times. Yeah. So there's always a way to come at it from a different... You can do the research if you're scholastic and you want to do the, the book work. You can always, if you say, oh, he didn't comment on one, Judges. Well, you can look it up and you find he may just have actually commented on it. Secondly, there is a space... He has kind of left us, like he's left that job to us yeah. as a forerunner. There is a space for us to go forward, and we are meant to have our journeys in digging in sacred text and always getting a stronger sense of truth, um, Paul, because one, here's one thing Swinburne actually said that just keeps blowing me away. 
He said, none of us are actually capable of receiving the truth. What we receive is appearances of truth. The truth further down our mind in different filtered layers. So we're all actually working with various levels of appearance of truth and it's getting clearer and clearer and clearer and we'll go on for eternity actually getting clearer and clearer which is quite an exciting thought because heaven's not supposed to be a boring place. So if I'm reading Deuteronomy for example, yes. one day it may actually make sense to me. It should and it will. It'll be interesting. It will, it'll open up. It def there have been times I've been reading it and it just opens itself up. Other times it's a little more work. Sometimes I'm looking at it and I haven't got a clue. So I will go and reference something, you know. And, and again, I would say, did you know, for example, that the Apocalypse, the Bible, last book of the Bible, which Swinwell wrote two books on, has over 400 references, the book itself. It's like Revelation. Revelation, the Revelation of Christ. It, it's almost actually just text of the Old Testament put together in, into a whole new form. Over 400 times in that book alone, there's an almost identical verse somewhere else in the Bible. So, for example, we all know the four horsemen of the apocalypse marching across the earth. You know, we've all heard that somewhere, the four horsemen. Well, in Zechariah, you get those four horsemen mentioned. So the, 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 there is always a way, if you're, if you're truly hungry, it'll come to you, Paul. Don't give up. There's always a, you'll get your answers for sure. Any other thoughts before we jump into the... Yeah, just don't forget there's, there's a book called Summaries. Summaries. He did summarise. That's called... His book is called Summaries of the Internal Sense of Prophets and Psalms. So all of the prophets, all of the Psalms, um, he just gives you one line for every couple of verses. But it, I, I'm, I'm reading that at the moment because I'm reading through the prophecy of Ezekiel. And I can look at each chapter I finish, and then I have a look, and, and in his, it's quite thin, just called summaries. Of the, because I know a lot of the books are now digital, but some of them are still not, you know, if you go to Actually, even the unpublished ones are digital now. They're all digital on New Christian Bible study. Not all the collateral works are. Not the collateral work, yeah. Uh, yeah, what Ian's saying there about summaries, I've used them too. In fact, I would say they've gone a little way into inspiring how I do this. So if you have a look at the text, we've got the, the passage up the top, then the bold is the text again a second time, and I've written in non-bold italics after it my best understanding of the spiritual sense, internal personal spiritual sense. Not absolute, I'm not saying I'm right, but it, it's a kind of a push into a summary of what that passage is what that sentence is saying and that's what you if, if you ever need a summary you might get the book of Zechariah that's what Swimble does it'll be Zechariah chapter 3 you know and there might be 12 verses and he says verses 1 to 3 are talking about this verses 4 to 8 talk about this and 9 to 12 talk about this it's great to get you sort of to, to, to get you thinking in spiritual patterns it really is so if I could draw your attention to the last line on the bottom page even though we did it last month we need to revisit it because it won't make sense as we go over the page the the pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself and again i've written here the internal chatter of the religious ego praising itself in the name of god and we've all had those voices inside ourselves haven't we you know we, we, we we're going along oh god i think i don't think i don't drive like him you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we all do it. It's okay. The thought comes, the thought goes. Unless you latch onto it and live there. That's when it becomes a problem. A lot of people think you're a saint. You better not let them down. You bet. <laughs> or I like this one, Bill. Never meet your heroes. Never meet because they will let you down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we turn over, you'll see, I have now unpacked this a little bit more, Paul. What I've written there, I've just felt that that needed a bit more teasing out. So I've unpacked it a little bit more. So that I've written it this way so that hopefully you or anyone else reading the parable can look at it, go, I'm getting a sense of what Darren's getting from this. Now I think I can actually have a go at it and start to get some of my own understandings. Because believe me when I say, the text will talk to you over and over and over again, the same text will talk to you next week and have a slightly different message for you. And none of them are wrong. They're just relevant for you right now. 
And there is an absolute truth there as well. That's the celestial that we're trying to go for, uh, Paul. And it's all about Jesus. The celestial reveals God to us. Oh, it's wonderful. Where the spiritual is about doing the work on us so we can be more like the Lord. Yeah. There's another part of who chatters away with us, and that's the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes. He's a, he chatters away, and he, there's a side to us which is critical and condemning of our mistakes and failures. Yes. The older brother couldn't understand why the younger brother went and played up. Exactly. And there's somebody, there's a voice in us which doesn't cope with and manage our sin and bad behaviour. Or that of others. Or that of others. Whatever the voice is doing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so well said. Look, I, I'll encourage people. We've been doing these parables now for how long is it in? Four years? Yeah, Five? Easy. Five years? This is, this is the second, third last. I've just finished working on The Good Shepherd. Oh, what a wonderful parable that is. It had to be broken into two. It's just so good. And then I think there's a parable of the pounds or something. And that will get us probably through to early next year. But I'm going to go back and we're going to restart again at the beginning of the parables. And we'll work our way through them all again. So if you want to be here, I encourage you to be here. Uh, because parables teach you the language of heaven. They teach you the language of spirit, of dreams. The language of correspondences. That's what unlocks the Bible for you, Paul. Because you get that language and then you can read any part of the Old Testament or New Testament and you see the deeper meaning in there. Yeah. So, this little bit here I've written is to try and unpack this bit about the internal chatter of the religious ego praising itself in the name of God. Love of self involves a hatred of others rather than a genuine sorrow or desire to see others freed from suffering and negative states. And that's a little bit of what you were asking about, Christine. When we discern something in someone and we feel for them, that's good. But if we discern something in someone and we start to hate them and judge them, we've passed judgment. That's a wrong kind of judgment, yeah. This self-love or hatred of others makes one withdraw from any real connection and instead the darkened soul stands aloof, exalting itself. And notice how the Pharisee stood over on the other side of the room of the temple and started saying his prayers. Oh, God. It smells better over here, Lord. You know? But, you know, we're going to find out that this humble side of us too, the, the lowly citizen, also stands aloof, but for a very different reason. So, Bill, would you mind reading a couple of these for us? God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. That's false humility and false thanksgiving based on one's own greatness. No real regard for the divine. And I want anyone to jump in at any point. If something jumps out at you and you've got a thought, a revelation or a question, just, just jump in there. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, which is self-righteous judgments of others drawn falsely from the word. I'll say something there. I remember hearing a, a person many years ago who was like a prophet. God would speak to him in, in dreams and visions. And the Lord showed him a vision of where fellow Christians were pulling out their swords and stabbing each other. And then the Lord said, no believer who gets their brother's blood on their sword will be in my kingdom. And then the Lord said, Every time you use the Word of God against someone else, that's exactly what you're doing. Now, the sword is to fight the enemy, the darkness. It's not for fighting each other. Well, isn't that Matthew 5.22? If, if you say to somebody, Raka, you're nothing, you don't even count. Wow. It's like, wow. It's like bowing a sword in me. Oh, yeah. that you're going to have trouble avoiding hell, mate. If you... If you uh, if you treat people that way, if you if you are dismissive, yes, yes, and, and sneering at the yes. people, but but that's that's that ruck area. Yeah. That's the sort. Back to what Paul is saying. If you work enough with sacred text, it starts to teach you as well. Look at the Psalms where Paul, where David says, "Oh, their tongues are like sharp swords; they cut at me, and their words cut deep." 
Because you think about it, Bill, when someone has a go at you like that, it really can wound, can't it? Mm. Unless you're a very strong person. So, you know, if can you're you... an introvert like me and somebody says something nasty to you about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, what happens is it goes round and round and round and round your head and you sit up in bed at half past 11 at night saying, that's not true. Oh. Now, if you happen to be an extrovert like the majority of people in Australia, I'm told, um, somebody has a go at you and says, criticises you, say, what, <coughs> what would you know, you buddy dickhead? Buzz <laughs> <laughs> on. And that's it. Grant, can we bl blot that bit out for all the children out there? No, just, I get the feeling there's not too many children watching these, oh, but that's all right. <laughs> that's all good, Bill. It's good. That's all good. I'm, it doesn't bother me. Okay, so come on, Bill, read some more. Right. Extortioners are... We read that one, yeah. Oh, we do. I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. Um, this is an internal egocentric... A chatter of self praise. And notice too how the ego is so good at keeping record of all its rights. Mm. <laughs> it's just so gifted. The ego is so gifted at keep keeping all my rights and all your wrongs. Yeah. And the public. Yep. Sorry, go on. Yep. Oh. Get back to your point, Paul. Paul. The word fast jumps out at me because it's self denial. Right. And what he's wow. saying is look at the things I've had to deny myself. Mm. And so you can pick up a flow if you just think about, you know, he's talking about fasting, but for us, it's the... Feeling sorry for ourselves? Self-denial. Uh, Self-denial? Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, I, I, I deny myself for my faith, this is what he's saying. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I go up to the temple, I empty my pockets, so fasting is all about what I've denied my, myself. Mm. As he's saying, just look, fasting means to deny yourself something. Sorry about it. Did you get one of these, Darren? Yeah, yeah, we're sharing. Oh, okay. Right. It's also about being a joyful giver. If you're saying, oh, I'm tithing and I'm doing, then, yeah, he's not doing it joyfully. No, he's not doing it joyfully. No. He's doing it, he's doing it out of... Um, yeah, the modern obligation is doing it out of pride, you know, I'll be seen to be doing that. You know, that, for those that were here last Sunday, I was trying, I didn't do a great job, but I tried to capture that sense with Mary bringing that oil to the Lord. It really came, I mean, the Lord, I just love it. Leave her alone. You who are picking on her, leave her alone. She's brought this gift mm. to my burial. There's something about when we get more and more mature, what that something is that we're actually falling in love. We're falling in love with God. And uh, you, there's just no burden in giving to the one you love. Yeah. There's no, it's just, yeah. But when it's for self, isn't it? Oh, oh, every pound of flesh we can get out of it. What are accolades? What are accolades? That's what I see about celebrities is you two, the band. Oh, we give this, we give that. Mm. Whereas you get heavy metal bands that people wouldn't listen to. There's some of the lyrics you wouldn't listen to. ACDC is one of them. They give so much to charity, but wow. they've never ever said they, they they talk about it. But there was a I was reading in this column in the newspaper one of the biggest givers of charity is ACDC, but wow. they never talk about it. Wow. Ever. So when you look at these. This is a good judgment thing. You look at ACDC with their long hair and tattoos, and uh, then you see you two all clean cut, or we give. So they're wanting accolades, but these ones aren't. It's just so, it's warning, isn't it? It's a warning not it, to judge. It, it, it is, and it, it's. I've got friends that are Latter Day Saints, and they fast once a month, but they don't talk about it. But the money they've saved on the two meals they've fasted. Wow. They choose a charity, so they get an envelope. Beautiful. And you, I'd say, RSPCL, just Cancer Foundation. They slip that in, and then the uh, bishop processes it. No one knows That's beautiful. who they do. It's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Isn't that beautiful? And mm. people I know of other denominations, oh, we give to this, we give to that. And then blow a trumpet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's funny how the parallels can happen on a big scale, like in our yes, society yes, now. Yeah, yeah. And, I don't know if I'm making sense here. But no, you're making sense. Uh, <laughs> but you can see it. And once you're 
spiritually awake and I explain to people that are atheists about well, how does God speak? Well, I say parables and I give certain examples and they go, wow. So, so that's how God gives us hints. And there's so many ways that we get hints, but yeah, anyway, I'm going off the track here. No, it's beautiful, but, but it's beautiful. I, I think sometimes, I think sometimes people may talk about their giving to inspire other people to step up. And that would like, be perfectly fine, fine, Jane, it would. And this again is why... So you need to, you don't you know weigh things up in the spirit. Motivation yep, the motivation. Perfectly said. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I do like those, they're very nice, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, they are. They're, they're wonderful people. I've got friends who are Latter-day Saints too. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there you go. You've got even more friends. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful. There's All right, well, let's... There's a discomfort there with... Uh, there's this polarizing it mm. like that it's like there's this touching on knocking on the door me a compa me a compa you know, yes. say me a compa yes. whatever you do you're probably not doing the right thing anyway or you, whatever there, there's that discomfort with um, guilt oh yes and, yeah. and, and words can define things but they but they can eliminate things like they don't. They don't encompass um, everything. It's like when you say one thing, it eliminates a whole lot of other things. That's a good point. Then wow. It's very complicated to encompass everything. The whole thing yeah. in words and that balance, because ultimately it's about balance and and reality. Now, for some reason, I need to say this, but it's like um, it's about. I was a teenager and I used to go to this, um, there used to be like a folk club up in Ann Street, does anyone old enough to remember, remember that? that. <laughs> and and um, there was this, and I nearly got sucked into this because I was so non-judgmental and don't, you know, make any etc, etc. <clears throat> and this yes. older man approached me and he started this, what I can see now is a grooming, oh you've got beautiful hair like oh, my wow. sister and you're this and you're that. And, and um, oh, you're in, I was just doing senior then. Oh, and look, uh, I've got this wonderful job up in um, Townsville. You could you could come up there, like you, you could come with me tonight. Oh I said, my no, goodness! I have to tell my friend. You don't have to. You can ring them. There. And it's like, and what's oh the job? Goodness. Oh, public relations, and stuff like that. And I realise now, because that, that I even listen to it. Like I, I think I would have rather been that Aussie girl. You know, saying something very far get away. Do you think I'm going to listen to any more of this? But no, no, because I was trying to accommodate what he was saying, not trying to be judgmental. And he was basically grooming me to some sort of prostitution yeah. thing. That he, wow. it's, but it's only when I was older that I realised mm. what he was doing. Because that that naive but also earnest and trying to be non-judgmental teenager yes. without the life experience yes. could have you know, if it had just been a couple of other things, I could have been somehow talked or somehow made to feel, look, that's a reasonable thing to say. You know, yes. Blah, blah, blah. And, and I think we can be just too non-judgmental. Oh, my goodness. I think, and how, how do we articulate Discernment, yes. To, um, to um, not, yeah. It, it, well, we Christine, you so know, it says, it, it, again, it says in sacred text, it says, judgment begins in the house of God. Right, and that means discernment starts here. And I think you have just highlighted an incredible point because often in Christianity, people are told, don't be judgmental. And so out goes the water, but so did the, bar, uh, so did the baby. Because as you have, right from the start of this sacred circle, you asked the right question. Define the difference between judgment and discernment. And if we don't have to, if you didn't have, if something didn't spark in you in that moment, you may have gone with him. And others have. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I like how sweet Paul said we must do things with wisdom. With wisdom. Love. Not just love. Uh, wisdom yes. is the one that's making it uh, try to work out, oh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? He calls it indiscriminate charity. And, and he says you can do harm. You know, your charity will do harm if you don't have wisdom. That's beautiful, yeah. Okay, so Chris, do you mind doing some reading? Yeah, sure. Um, 
would not lift up? Oh, the publican, yeah. Uh, and the publican standing afar off, true humanity wishes to uh, not... Humility. Oh, humility, sorry. But humanity's good too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, wishes to not impose upon others, nor harm them through any unregenerate... Uh, unregenerate arm deaths, um, states present within. That was good. Does that make sense, what the point, what, what that point I'm trying to make there? Mm. That when we have real humility, you know, Ian, you've kind of highlighted this for me using the car again, you know, you've been driving down the road and then somebody was in a hurry, screams around you, toots their horn at you and waves their fingers at you. And then you've described to me how you, you feel this wash of anger try to come over you. You resist it, you become calm, and off they go. And you realised in that moment hell was trying to flood over you. And I think we've all had that and got involved. Maybe told them a few things back because our window was went up. <laughs> Couldn't hear a thing I was saying. Isn't it? We, we kind of got sucked up into the energy of it. And I think humility says... Okay, the good that's in me is from the Lord, and I want to share that. But I know that there are things in me that are not good. And I'm a little hesitant. I'm trying to be wise. When's the right time for me to, to speak, and when's the right time for me to shut up, Lord? Because I don't want to impose some of my less regenerate states on other people. And that, when, when we're thinking like that, I, th I think we're really growing and maturing, and the Lord can smile on that. You know, he can use that. We're being, two men are going up to the temple. Which one is going down home, right with God? So do you want to keep going there, Chris? Would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his chest, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. True humility recognises the need for help, support and transformation. And I was going to say, True humility recognises the need for repentance. And I thought, no, it's true, but it's not, it's not what I feel this text is saying. It's the need for help. It's that safety that, that you know, people come to Bill because they feel safe enough to say, Bill, I really need some help. And Bill doesn't do the Pharisee feel good about himself and shoot them down. He says, I'm going to be a friend with you and join you and try and find you help. You know? But it's that feeling safe to need help. You know, that's, that's that state of humility that the Lord's looking for in us. We don't have to always be perfect. But I tell you what, there is plenty of people out there in the world that if you don't come across perfect, they'll shoot you down. And they'll tell you how broken you are. Or what was it, Bill, you were saying? The, the broken bus thing, the, you know, how, how worth well, it. Well, yeah. well, they don't say, you know, it's... it's, it's well, I've got this downer on psychiatrist now that... <laughs> But there are other people who are always sort of, uh, you know, psychologists aren't doing all that well either. Uh, pointing out your, uh, your weak points and all that sort of stuff. And, yes. Uh, a few social workers and all this sort of stuff. No, no, no wonder we're a, a suffering. No wonder the millennials are all miserable. Or, uh, or whatever they are. So, uh, yeah. And if we want to get help, if we do feel that, we'll tend to go on through this mm. instead of going to a human being. Well, Professor Gurgle doesn't pick on you, does he? No. Not really? No. Or Professor Duck Duck Go. <laughs> that was my bit for Duck and Duck it, Go. And it is easy to go to those other things rather it's... than, for, you know, the first thing we should be doing is praying about it, but you tend to ask somebody else's advice or, you know, yeah, as you said, Google it, and yeah, you don't pray about it as oh. the first step. Let's let's just pray. Just say with me. Say, Lord, Lord, if we take anything away today, if we take anything away today, help us, help us turn to you, turn to you first, first before all other things. Amen. 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 Yeah, such a good point, Jane. That really was a good point. Okay, Chris, go and have another go there. Jump in there for us. I tell you. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. A true revelation which internal states of mind cause the external life to be holy before the sight of the Lord. Keep, keep, keep reading there, yeah. 
Within this parable, we have a direct comparison between going up into the temple and going down into his house. The key to understanding these differences can only be found by ex examining one's thoughts and feelings concerning oneself, the world and other people. Justification or the justifying of one's life, actions and choices as holy conduct must occur in the light of heaven. In that light, the advancing soul discovers that our life is self-focused, emotionally selfish in nature. The Lord alone has unconditional love for all souls. This heavenly light allows for the desire to awaken within us, whereupon we seek to be more and more like our Lord, and thus we happily, happily engage in spiritual practices and spiritual combats that enable us to overcome the lower ego self, self-justifying states religious ego, and live from the heavenly ego, humility and services to other others. Now I don't do this very often, but I was feeling strongly, Darren, is there something you want to say? You haven't been, I mean... No, not, not in particular. No? <laughs> you sure? Yeah. I'll leave it go then. I just thought you might have had something to... No, no, no well, to... pretty much everything that's been going through my mind has been brought up by someone in the group anyway, so... Right, so they're all... It's, it's all, all done. They're stealing oh, your thunder. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> they're reading your thoughts. <laughs> Does this make sense, what we're sort of saying here, this idea that... that it's okay to be self-focused. It's kind of what our biology does. It keeps us alive. But when we lift our mind up into heaven's light, we go, oh, I'm actually not so darn holy as I first thought. You know, the Lord alone is the true source of clean, pure waters of selfless love. And that's okay. Because then you start to drink it and you go, oh, I want to be more like that. You know, I... I'd like to put some of my selfish burdens down a little bit and actually just splash a bit of living water on other people and let them taste, because that's really good, Lord. And that's the process. And we go on again and do self-focused things, and then we get a little bit more light. Oh, I'm doing it again. Let me focus on other people. And we splash a bit more water, and gradually, gradually, we become more and more like the Lord until there comes a point where people are just getting wet all the time around you. And they're just blessed to be around you. You know, isn't that the goal? Or as Bill says, sometimes you get around places and you go, oh, there's a nice peace here. Well, there is, there is. Uh, I, I'd just like to make a comment about this word justify. This is a, a, a word that's used in the Bible a lot. Yes. But uh, I think it means made better. Oh, beautiful. Made, made just, rather than, you know, if you justify yourself, you know. Uh, this man went down to his house, made a, a, made a slightly better man. Well, I'm going to make Bill read that last part, because he's kind of, he's, he, what's in the very bit, it's kind of what you're saying there in the bottom bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. With where? Here. Well, is, is, does anyone else want to jump in first? Does any, anyone else want to say anything else before we go there? Like, is there any other thoughts or ideas coming up? No? I, I, yep. I find in this an encouragement to set aside time to go up to the temple. Yes, wow. And, and I think each of us has to find a spiritual practice that works for us. Go first to the Lord when there's a problem. You know, I... I don't, I don't have to tell you what mine is, but I have a spiritual practice. And I I think it's, it's really, really important for us to do that. Yeah, to, Martin Luther used to spend an hour each morning praying. He, he made it his practice all through his life. It doesn't mean we've got to become cut off from the world and pious, but you know, we need to touch God's Word at some point early in the day so that we can come up into the temple and then go down with a different attitude. Into daily life. To what the day asks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Wow. No, Ian, I, you know, it can be as simple as soon as your eyes open in the morning and you're still lying on the bed 
And it's a good time because you, in the mind, the, the, I like it. Renee says, I haven't had my coffee and the ego isn't awake yet. Yeah, that's true. You know, like, <laughs> and so, well, she would say tea, but I, I would say coffee. But so it's that good time to just let, you know, let yourself go up to the temple. What a beautiful, affectionate thought. Go up to the temple, talk to the Lord before we've had a chance to turn the computer on and Google it. Talk to the Lord and just take that that aroma of humility throughout the day with you. Wonderful, and yeah, thank you so much. Go on, Bill, jump through these next two bits for us there, because well, particularly the... Everybody, the fourth light down, this heavenly life. Did, okay, keep, was that Chris? Was that was Chris's reading then? Did I interrupt you, did I, Chris? Sorry. No, no, I finished that. I think you won it. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, Sorry. and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The lower ego leads to temporal delights, followed by external destruction, while the heavenly ego leads to self-abasement, followed by everlasting life in the Lord, the delight of being of service to and, and before you keep reading, what, what came to my thought then was the Buddhist monk who, you, you know, who's sitting there with a cup of tea and the, the student has got all these questions and the Buddhist monk just keeps pouring the tea till it's spilling over. And then the, the student says, Master, what are you doing? And he says, well, you're like this cup. You know, he said, pouring, 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 pouring. He said, be still, be quiet, empty the cup so there can be something to fill it with. That sort of came to my mind there. When, when we abase ourselves, it can sound quite derogatory, but really what we're saying is come out of the turbulent waters of the earth below, come up into the space in between, day two of Genesis, come up into the space in between and just observe. Be the observer. And that's called heaven. That space in between is called heaven. So it's just, abasing yourself is just saying, I'm going to empty myself of egocentric thoughts. And then a blessing can flow in. Your cup can flow over and all the good stuff can come in. All right, so you keep going, Bill. The Lord spoke like no other and with a power to cut through the fog of the ego. When speaking to the self-justifying religious leaders of his day, he warned them and us by saying of them, Who pays tithe of mint and ice and cumin, and amidst the weightier matters of the Lord, judgment, mercy, and faith? Matthew 23, 23, 23. Here the Lord is highlighting the three most important aspects of spiritual life, judgment, mercy, and faith. Thanks. And Bill, I'm wanting to focus on your sense of judgment. Say it again. What is your sense of what judgment really means? To do, to do, to fix things up, or to do right, or something. What were judgment. you saying? You said you had it. You said, oh, people read this word. Oh no, no, it was justify. It was justify. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's just that the word judgment and justice are connected. Yeah. That's where my thoughts. They're the same word in the Hebrew. Sorry, judgment and justice. So to do justice is what? Sorry. You, well, to justify means... Well, to, to just, see, we use the word these days, oh, I justified uh, doing that because I wanted to show such and such. Right, yeah. You, just, you explain. You, uh, but justify, it there really means make just. To make just. To make just. All right, right, keep reading. We'll keep that in our thoughts. Yeah. Judgment or make just. Make it So way, exemplify means to make exemplary. Yeah. yeah. So judgment, mercy, and faith, and that word judgment or justice is to make right, to fix it, to make it right, to make just, yeah. fix it up. Compare the Lord's statements to that of Micah six eight. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. It's not hard to see from this comparison that real faith in God requires us to walk in true humility while looking to the Lord as our only source of goodness and truth. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Yeah, it says other. In the original yeah, other. When I, when I read Sweetwell, the thing that he really, really gets up his nose is religious uh, arrogance. And mm. He really 
Because because there's no room for it in heaven. No. And if we're carrying that kind of smell with us, people will be saying, I think you need to go and have a wash. <laughs> it's not Yeah. Okay, so is there any other thoughts on that now? I, yep. I just I didn't in the nineteen nineties. I had a lot to do with Wales. My father in law was very, very Welsh. He spoke Welsh. And he attended chapel as Welsh people did their huge revival in nineteen hundred and four in Wales. Did you know the Welsh chapels are furnished in such a way that the leading 12 laymen, it's always 12, 12 right. horses, right. It's 12 seats at the front. Huh. And if as a member of the congregation you either hadn't come to chapel or you were found out to have sinned, oh. you were brought into the chapel publicly. Oh. and admonished by these 12 people. Wow. So there being 12 seats at the front. That came to mind. Came to mind. It's actually got itself into various stories, true stories. You have girls pregnant before they're married and that sort of thing being dragged into the chapel for public humiliation. But that's what came to mind, Bill, when you said it was well, a little truck with religious arrogance mm. and a sense of superiority that you know, about other sinful people. There's a truth. If I, you can't do, can't do that. There's 10,000. Wales is only about as big as your hand. Hmm. There's 10,000 chapels <sighs> in Wales. And Ian, there's nothing, there's nothing about loving mercy in no, that, no, is no, there? No, there's no, no love of mercy in no, that kind of condemnation. 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 And people mean well because they're trying to help each other, but at the end of the day, they're, they're getting blood all over their swords. You know, they're not actually you know, getting blood over their swords. So, Sean, there was something you were wanting to... Yeah, very similar in the part is uh, being a missionary uh, for the last uh, uh, quarter of the century. And uh, we were constantly talk about how we can, you know, uh, transform that our... Uh, society or of the largest group, um, largest people group in the world. And uh, so that's why we feel those people, wow, it's a, look, we have chosen group in a very tiny, like, uh, what, well, that time probably 1%, uh, 2% of the, uh, well, well, we are right. Look, you are the yes. all of the sinful. You are the nasty. You want to so They are very proud of themselves, mm. and then it, so they are literally keeping distance. Distance. So that's yeah. Really, contempt. That, that's contempt. Contempt. And then yeah. they are literally being marginalized by those uh, sinful people. Yeah. Yeah. And then they are good. Raw well, looks. But they have been marginalized, so no any influence mm. to the society. <laughs> and mm. uh, we were particularly uh, something, some like uh, 27 years, we we were learned from Taiwan, because mm. communist China in Beijing is very hard to learn these kind of things. We mm. went to Taiwan, and then we found out, well, only 1.5% of Christian in Taiwan, but 15% of Buddhists. Okay. Why? Why? They don't. Okay. The Buddhists, they knew how to do it merciful yes. to, to the society. Yes, yeah, to serve. To uh, serve, that's why. To serve, serve society. society. Yeah. And people, well, love they are serving, and then they accumulated people's heart. Mm. Exactly. Well, mm. So now we have understood that thing. Uh, so, yeah. so, yeah, truly, it, it's mm. not a feel we are here, we are righteousness, and <laughs> then we have to be humble That's to right. serve yeah. in the society. So this kind of, I think, very important, particularly now, how we can transform uh, China, yes. particularly yes. using the gospel yeah. transform, because 
got to be preparing them because they are going to be the largest missionary sure. wow. tsunami to the world mm. to hit the Muslim war, uh, atheist war, and Buddhist war before get into yes. Jerusalem. So this kind of a feel that I yes. think we'll... W one last point I'd like to make, and then we should read the spiritual focus and say a prayer. Here's the last point I'd like to make. This here about being lowly in mind. And I can't remember if it was Carl Jung or if it was C.S. Lewis, or it could have been somebody else completely different. I'm, I'm trying to remember. But the quote goes, uh, you know, that, uh, that being humble is not thinking less of yourselves, it's thinking about yourself less. Yeah. And that's what lowly of mind means. It doesn't mean that you're down on yourself. How could, how should, you shouldn't be down on yourself if God loves you and thinks you're unique. But you just don't think of yourself at all. You put your thoughts on others and serving others and blessing others. That's, that's, the, that's the way out of the ego trap. Because if you're down on yourself, there's always a, an element of, I'm so lowly, you go first, I'm such a humble dog, you go first, I'm, I'm so spiritually advanced, you go first. You know, there's a false humility in that, a kind of false, there's a pride. But I, I like it. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Less, less often. Less often. Less often. Yeah. Simple. I, I think when you do that as well, those things that you're bearing out from become a lot less important. So you're not denying yourself. I knew there was something you had to add. Say that again. That was really... Well, no, well, those, those things that you start off by denying yourself. Yes. Um, they no longer become important because you see what is important. And it's that, that vision of the Lord first. And that way, whenever, even going back to where we started with the difference between discernment and judgment, when you're thinking of the Lord first before you think of those things... Yes then you're not condemning, you're not justifying, you're not doing anything except thinking, where can I be of use here? Yes, and when you think that the mind, hang on a sec, the mind is a magnifying glass for the soul. So what you focus on is being magnified or manifest, like the secret, you know? You're magnified, but if it's all, oh, I'm so lowly, I'm so lowly, then you've still not got any time, energy to serve others because you're so focused on how lowly you are. Isn't that amazing? You know, you, you, they, they become less important, don't they, Darren? Because you're not magnifying them anymore. Uh, Sorry, Bill, what were you going to... very common application that people are trying to stop drinking or smoking. Yeah. Right. And uh, if, you, if you adopt the approach, well, now, look, let's start... You've stayed off the grog now for three days. Let's see if we can make it five... Five days. days and get up to 11 days. And yes. You're doing really well, you're doing really well. Actually, that's not the way to go because you're thinking about it. Someone said you're not allowed to eat licorice. <coughs> I've been thinking about licorice. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> I'd go and buy a kilo of licorice. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but that's right. So, if you, refocusing. Yeah, yeah, think yeah. about something else instead. Mm. Wonderful, beautiful. Yeah, so that was, Darren, that was spot on. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, become less important. Let's <laughs> talk about the thing about a couple of weeks ago, Sarah behind the pastor, uh, be beside the pastor, and then she, with the tears, what, why? Okay. I make people cry. <laughs> I should shower more. She, she actually feels pastor more warm mm. than this uh, righteousness uh, husband. Because uh, in the home where everything's mm, set up the very high level of the righteousness uh, standard. Mm. And both of these two girls feel, wow, it's, uh, every day has to be climbing to mm. <laughs> and then for you know for, you know, for, you know, for, for example like uh, even even three days ago i said look you were using you, you your teeth because she pick up a lolly pick up a, a, a big biscuit pick up this thing you know, and uh, damage her a lot of uh teeth you know so we see a dentist uh, more often mm. only for her but i said look i'm 
only using my tea seven times a week. Mm. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> you know that I, I need to say, share with you. But that, these kind of things, but in our home, I mean, many, many other things, I say, look, we can't, you know, the, 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 the God giving us uh, the, the light yes. is for us to working for him. Yes. It's not, a, not a wasting his time. Time is life. You know, wasting life on the bed, you know. And, and Sean, we always go up to the temple with two men or two women. The, 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 this will always be there in our life. We always bring it up. Just keep choosing the humble man to go back down. You're like, just keep, every day we just keep choosing the humble man to go back down. Yeah. That's, that's the answer, I think. So, so, so I think it's, a, it's an overcome myself first. And then I'm always, because I'm, I'm actually most of the youngest and the oldest pastor in our society in that mm. time. Because uh, during the Cultural Revolution, no, no pastors. And uh, the youngest pastor or already 80 plus years old. That is. So these kind of things, we are always uh, like uh, dress up and uh, snobbish, you know, <laughs> other people. Mm. It's kind of look. Yes. Kind of a, I mean. Elitism? Well, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Problems. Majority yeah. of us yes. didn't realize that. And one of the pastor's uh, wife, Ooh, it's a yeah, oh, very uh, speaking fluently, you know. And then, and then she make her husband to uh, dilute the authority, and then make her husband and you know, cut long story short. Eventually, the one of the largest over thousand people's church collapsed. Oh, it's because of the husband. Uh, uh, because of the wife criticizing the husband, oh. uh, it is uh, you know you 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 you, you are preaching have uh, some part is uh, not uh, correct. Right. It's because of uh, look the Bible is saying yeah. in front of congregation. It's kind of things like that. Yeah. Lacking of uh, the. <laughs> the humility. But, yeah. yeah. Humility. But, but, uh, but all it's righteous. Yes. Thank you, Bishen. That's beautiful. <laughs> let's let's read the focus quickly and then we'll say a quick prayer. The spiritual focus. So this month, take notice of any time when you are judging others, holding them to a higher standard or even despising them for their choices. Interrupt such thoughts with the reminder that you have equally failed the Lord and a righteous standard. Seek the Lord for his mercy and offer thoughts of compassion and even prayers for those you were judging. That's a good challenge for us to try and catch ourselves out this month, judging. Oh, I did it again, I'm judging. Lord, I say a prayer and then do that. Okay, so let's bow our heads quickly and pray. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, we're so grateful that your word gives light, but Lord, your word also gives heat. It gives encouragement. It calls to us, it doesn't push us, it's not harsh. It's loving and it woos to us. Let us take away today, Lord, those thoughts such as what Jane said. Let us be quick to go to you. Let us be quick to not judge. But Lord, we also thank you that we have discernment, even as Christina said, that we're not being fooled, that, that devils don't try to take advantage of us, but that we are wise, as Paul said, and that our acts of charity are filled with your wisdom. Go with us, Lord, in all that we do. Amen. Amen. So I think it's time for a cup of tea or something like that. Yeah, no, coffee's coffee is ready. Coffee! Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Is the machine on? Right. Is it on? Uh, See, thinking ahead. Oh. My mind is, why did you decide to become a sci-fi?